Uh, approximately a third of all American presidents have some degree of Ulster Scots ancestry. Some of them are very, very close to Ulster uh, in terms of chronology. Others, perhaps, they, they read a bit more removed. Um, I didn't want to talk to you for about three minutes on something like 15 or 16 American presidents. Uh, I'm just going to talk to you about a small number of American presidents that I have a particular liking or affection for. <laughs> um, uh, well, you could complain afterwards, but uh, we'll see how it goes. Some of these, um, and the, particularly the first one, uh, you may be all familiar with, yet arguably he's one of the most successful Ulster Scots American presidents. Uh, this is James K. Polk. James K. Polk was a protege of Andrew Jackson, the seventh president of the United States. While Jackson is quite correctly regarded as the first and perhaps the greatest Ulster Scots president, Polk is, is scarcely less impressive as the second Ulster Scots holder of the office. Both Jackson and Polk were born in the Carolinas. Polk was born in North Carolina, but both North and South Carolina compete for the honor of being Jackson's birthplace, although Jackson thought he was born in South Carolina. Another similarity is they both practiced law and both made their way politically in the state of Tennessee. Polk bore a strong physical resemblance to Jackson. Both had gone faces, high foreheads, and swept back hair. Whereas Jackson was old hickory, Polk became young hickory. However, Polk differed from Jackson in a number of respects. Polk was not as gregarious or outgoing as Jackson had, had been, and had little time for the social world which Jackson clearly enjoyed. Polk was a, a loner and a workaholic. Nor was Polk a man to go out of his way to court popularity. He was a much more committed Christian than Jackson and spent much of his leisure time reading the Bible. Polk became the original dark horse candidate of US politics by winning the 1844 Democratic Party's presidential nomination over a host of better known candidates. The support of the elderly Andrew Jackson was of crucial importance. Although the dark horse term or candidate is usually associated with American politics, the term, surprisingly enough, makes its first appearance in one of Disraeli's novels, The Young Duke. So the idea of a dark horse candidate is actually a British idea rather than an American one. At this stage, uh, there were two major political parties in the United States, the Democrats and the Whigs. The Whig campaign against Polk majored on what they considered the mediocrity of Polk the plotter. Henry Clay, who was the Whig candidate, jeered, who is James K. Polk? During the election campaign, Democrats replied that Polk was the candidate who stood for expansion point that we'll go back in a moment to in a moment. After the election, they were able to provide the best answer of all, the President of the United States. <laughs> the Democrats uh, accused Henry Clay, the Whig presidential nominee, of having systematically violated, sin by sin, every one of the Ten Commandments. The Democrats claimed that the history of Mr. Clay's debaucheries and midnight revelries was too shocking to appear in public print. However, this did not prevent the Democrats going into some detail about many of these matters. In other words, it was a fairly typical 19th century presidential election. In other words, you threw as much more as you could at your opponent. Despite being described as the dark horse candidate, Polk was by no means or no stretch of imagination uh, an unknown candidate. And this was something that Henry Clay did appreciate in, in private. On the contrary, uh, Polk had been a member of Congress for seven consecutive terms, a governor of Tennessee for one term, 
a la conscientious but perhaps slightly partisan Speaker of the House of Representatives. Three interesting observations may be made about the election of 1844. First, it was the last presidential election to be held on different days in different states. In 1848 and in all subsequent uh, elections, all the states have gone to the polls on the same date in November. Secondly, unusually for a successful presidential <coughs> candidate, Polk failed to carry the state in which he was born, North Carolina, and the state in which he resided, Tennessee. The latter, admittedly, made only 123 votes, which is little of it. Finally, overall, it was an extremely close contest. Polk won only 38,181 votes more than Clay. But we're talking about uh, <coughs> uh, 1,337,000 one Two hundred forty-three votes to one million two hundred and ninety-nine thousand and sixty-two. So you know it is a very tiny margin. And Polk won by carrying uh, several states by very very narrow margins indeed. When he assumed office on the fourth of March, eighteen forty-five, Polk was aged forty-nine, and at that point he was the youngest man to hold. <coughs> Date. At his inaugural, Polk did not allow his spirit to be dampened by a steady downpour of rain. With total confidence in his expansionist program, he told the audience, Our system may be safely extended to the utmost bounds of our territorial limits, and that, as it shall be extended, the bonds of our union, so far from being weakened, will become stronger. As president, uh, Polk set himself five major aims or objectives. Firstly, the annexation of Texas. Secondly, the settlement of the Oregon boundary dispute with the United Kingdom. Thirdly, tariff reform. Fourthly, the establishment of an independent treasury. And lastly, the acquisition of California. Having a strong sense of mission, Polk possessed determination, the skill, and the energy to achieve it. He is probably the only man in American history who was able to leave the presidency happy in the knowledge that he achieved exactly what he set out to achieve. During his presidency, he achieved either the largest or possibly the second largest expansion of the United States territory to the annexation of Texas, the acquisition of the Oregon Territory, which is the modern states of Washington, Oregon, and Idaho, and by uh, purchasing 525,000 square miles of territory in the southwest of California in 1948. Polk gave reality to the term manifest destiny. What is manifest destiny? This, this is the belief that the United States was divinely ordained or destined to expand right across the North American continent from the Atlantic seaboard to the Pacific Ocean. As President uh, Polk kept a diary, which reveals a man of great integrity weighed down by the cares of office, he found dealing with office bearers or office secret brother, especially time consuming and very wary. In the American political system, he just went to the president and he asked him, I would like to be the postmaster in some, some back place in the back end of absolutely nowhere that the president was expected to, to, to deliver. Uh, that is rather serious. Like it's, it's a returning up to Storm and asking to be the, the postmaster in Belle Coupe. <laughs> Belle Coupe, by the way, is on 12 miles up the road from where I am. <laughs> By the end of his first and only, only term, and, and he had pledged himself quite specifically to uh, not seek a second term, he was in poor health and he died within three months of leaving office in Nashville in June 1849. So that's probably a warning against being an alcoholic, uh, not an alcoholic, uh, a workaholic. <laughs> no, he wasn't an alcoholic. <laughs> 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 I better not go there. He, he was the first um, American president to be photographed frequently while in office. 
Historians and political scientists have admired Polk's ability to set an agenda and achieve it. Americans are incredibly keen on rank ordering their presidents. Uh, for example, the first three presidents, now you might disagree, disagree with the best ones they regard as Roosevelt, Lincoln and Washington. Now you can mess around with the order of those. I have noticed that in recent times, sort of the top six, uh, the, the next three have moved about a bit. Uh, when it comes to the worst American president, um, it's usually a, a, a toss-up between Andrew Jackson and James Buchanan. James Buchanan and Andrew Jackson were both Ulster Scots. James Buchanan was Abraham Lincoln's predecessor, and uh, Andrew Johnson was his successor. On um, current form, uh, um, Donald Trump is regarded as the third worst American president. Well, that might be a premature. But I do personally expect him to replace uh, uh, Buchanan and, and uh, uh, Johnson at the bottom of the pile. Um, anyway, while Polk normally falls just outside the top six US presidents, he's usually ranked between 8th and 12th on the list of greatest presidents. Where did Polk come from? Well, I'm not sure that we actually know. He almost certainly emigrated, or his family emigrated via the port of Londonderry. So people tend to assume that if, if you emigrated from Londonderry, you actually came from Londonderry. I think it's actually quite likely that he actually, the family had its roots either in County Londonderry, County Tyrone, or County Donegal. I, I wouldn't want to be too specific about this. But uh, the family actually was long established in America. They arrived in the, in the American colonies around 1680. And as I say, uh, that's the, they could have come from Donegal, Tyrone, or Londonderry. And it's generally assumed that the family name was originally Pollock, and that Polk is in fact a contraction of uh, Pollock. The next president I was going to talk to you about is Ulysses S. Grant. Now, Ulysses S. Grant was elected President of the United States in November 1868 and took up office in March 1869. He is the subject of a, of a huge doorstep biography in recent times by a man called Ron Chernow, who actually also wrote a, a, a book on Andrew Hamilton, which is the basis of the, the musical. Um, Chernow's um, biography will go a long way in rehabilitating um, Grant's reputation. Up until recent times, Grant's reputation stood fairly low in terms of American presence. But as Cherno explains, in the stock market of historical reputations, Grant's stock is definitely rising. And that is true. That's very true. In 1768, Grant's maternal fa grandfather, John Simpson, set out from the townland of Georgina near Ballygolly in County Tyrone to make a new life for himself in the American colonies. We fast forward, in 1819, the Simpson family moved from uh, Pennsylvania to settle in Ohio. And in June 1821, a man called Jesse R. Grant, a tanner, married Hannah Simpson. Their third child would become the commander of all the Union armies during the United States Civil War and the 18th President of the United States. After the Confederate surrender at Appomattox in April 1865, Hannah Simpson observed to her son, You've become a great man, haven't you? And she quietly resumed her sewing. The typical Ulster Scots woman, not easy. As a war hero, the man who brought the Civil War to a successful conclusion and the military saviour of the Union, Grant seemed to be an obvious choice for the Republic Party's nominee in 1868. But he lacked both the political experience and political ambition. Initially, his, uh, his uh, ambition did not extend beyond wishing to become the mayor of Galena, his Illinois hometown. You know, he basically wanted to fix the potholes. However, he became the darling of the radical Republicans because he had defied President Johnson and Andrew Johnson 
over army appointments, and he allowed himself to be persuaded. One might have supposed that he would have been a shoe-in for the presidency, but Horatio Seymour, his democratic opponent, made it quite a close contest for the popular vote, although not in the electoral college. Newly enfranchised black voters were largely responsible for giving Grant his margin victory in the popular vote, about 300,000 votes. The closeness of the popular vote surprised the political elites of both political parties at the time, and by this stage you had the Republican Party and the Democratic Party and the, the two radical parties. Despite Grant's inexperience, he was the first president since Andrew Jackson served two full terms, even though he was often out of his depth, a point he candidly conceded in his last annual message to Congress. He said, It was my misfortune, or my fortune, to be called to the office of Chief Executive without any previous training. And under such circumstances, it is but reasonable to suppose that errors of judgment must have occurred. That sort of level of quality is quite refreshing, is it not? Yet his record was far more respectable than most people or many people have allowed. Grant made strenuous efforts to promote reconciliation between the North and the South. He supported pardons for former Confederate leaders and sought to protect the, the rights of freed slaves. In 1870, the 15th Amendment, which gave black men the, the right to vote, was ratified. Grant signed legislation to curb the activities of the Ku Klux Klan and others who used violence to intimidate blacks and prevent them from voting. He periodically stationed federal troops in the South to maintain law and order. Some have claimed that Grant's actions violated states' rights. Others have argued that he did not do enough to protect free men. Well, he was walking the line. He was trying to maintain a balance. He was also responsible for establishing the Department of Justice, the Weather Bureau, and Yellowstone National Park. The United States uh, uh, First National Park. He reformed Indian policy with a view to improving conditions for Native Americans admittedly with only limited success. As a result of the Treaty of Washington in 1871, he improved relations between the United Kingdom and the United States. He failed to persuade the Cong Congress to annex Santo Domenico, one of his pet projects. Shortly after Grant became president, a new word entered the English language, Grantism which is shorthand for nepotism, the spoils system, and corruption in high office. Although Grant himself was a man of integrity, many of his acolytes uh, subscribed to very lax standards, and his presidency was mired in scandal. In 1872, a group of Republicans who unjustly believed Grant was corrupt formed the Liberal Republican Party. This group nominated New York uh, newspaper editor Horace Greeley, another Ulster Scott, as their presidential candidate. Greeley was also nominated by the Democrats in the hope that their combined vote would, come, would be sufficient to defeat Grant. The contest became billed as one between a man of no ideas, that was Grant, and a man of too many ideas, that was Greeley. Because in the course of his life, Greeley had been an enthusiast for causes as diverse as vegetarianism, abolitionism, brown bread, free thinking, socialism, and spiritualism. Grant had a, an easy victory, carrying 31 states to Greeley's six, and winning 286 votes out of the 349 in the Electoral College. During Grant's second term, the United States slid into depression in 1873, as indeed did most of the rest of the world. And his presidency was mired in even more scandal, including one involving Grant's private secretary. This was an era dominated by machine politics and the patronage system of political appointments, by which politicians rewarded their supporters with government jobs and they, in turn, kicked back 
partner salaries to the political party. Grant addressed this issue by establishing a civil service commission to recommend fairer methods of hiring and promoting government employees. However, civil service reform faced stern opposition from Congress and members of Grant's own administration. And by 1876, the Commission's funding was closed down and reforms such as competitive exams were discontinued. Reform only came in 1883 with the Pendleton Civil <coughs> Service Act under yet another Ulster Scots American president. After he left office, Grant himself was the victim of a fraudulent investment firm. Bankrupt and suffering from inoperable throat cancer, but determined to leave his family financially secure, Grant heroically completed his memoirs shortly before his death. Published by his friend Mark Twain, the personal memoirs of Ulysses S. Grant, two volumes, were both a literary masterpiece and a stunning commercial success. Only a year after their publication, Twain was able to present Grant's widow with a royalty check for $200,000. Shortly before he died, Grant told his doctor how many years before, on his way to a reception in his honour, he shared his umbrella with a complete stranger who was going to the reception. I have never seen Grant, the stranger remarked, as the two men walked together, and I merely go to satisfy a personal curiosity. Between us, I've always thought that Grant was an overrated man. That's my view also, Grant told him. <laughs> Grant was always a very humble and modest man. Next president probably was, that I want to talk to you about has probably never been accused of humility. Probably most presidents have never been accused of humility. This is Theodore Roosevelt. <coughs> Theodore Roosevelt was the 26th president of the United States and was a descendant of Klaus van Roosevelt a Dutchman who settled in New Amsterdam in the mid 17th century. And the site of his farm has disappeared under the, the weight of the Empire State Building. TR, as Theodore Roosevelt liked to be known as, had also significant Scottish, Ulster Scots, and English ancestry. Ancestors of Martha Bullock, Roosevelt's mother, had emigrated from Larne in 1729. He referred to his Ulster Scots ancestors as, quote, a stern, virile, bold, and hardy people who formed the kernel of that American stock who were the pioneers of our people's march westwards. So he was actually very proud of his Ulster Scots ancestry. Uh, on the other hand, I would have to say that, uh, uh, his, that the, uh, Grant didn't really talk very much about his Ulster Scots ancestry. Anyway, uh, uh, Roosevelt was born in New York in 1858. He was a sickly and asthmatic child who, by taking up various demanding sports, adopted a strenuous lifestyle, and sheer determination enabled him to turn himself into a man of action. During the course of his life, he climbed the Matterhorn, hunted big game in Africa, and explored Brazil. After his wife and mother died on the same day, he spent two years as a gentleman cowboy and rancher in the bad lands of Dakota, where he was initially underestimated and mocked by the locals as four eyes. He had very poor eyesight and wore John George type of glasses. During his time in Dakota, he managed to write a four-volume history of the American frontier. He was a graduate of Harvard, and he was both an accomplished historian and a popular author. He served as President McKinley's Assistant Secretary to the Navy between 1897 and 1898. He resigned when the United States went to war with Spain to lead a volunteer cavalry unit known as the Rough Riders in Cuba. Now this is not entirely true, but uh, certainly later in the year I will address these issues more directly. On the 1st of July 1898, uh, he famously led a charge up San Juan Heights, 
mounted on his horse little Texas and waving his hat. Like that's the con conventional wisdom. But if you probe a little further, the story's a wee bit embellished. Anyway, he relished war as a sport, regarded the first day of July 1898 as the greatest day of his life and achieved celebrity. Between 1898 and 1900, he served as governor of New York and antagonized Republican bosses by his vigorous opposition to corruption. They concluded that TR would cause less bother as vice president, so he became President McKinley's running mate in June 1900. In other words, this is a clear example of promoting somebody that causes bother and trouble up upwards and could get them out of the way. The chairman of the Republican National Committee was appalled at the prospect that only one life existed between that damned cowboy and the White House. <laughs> when the anar an anarchist shot McKinley in sem September 1901, that's exactly what happened. TR became the youngest ever president at the age of 42, and unless I've missed something, that remains the record. Um, he narrowly uh, pips J.F. Kennedy, who was 43. T.R. loved being president, and especially the conduct of foreign policy. He loved being at the centre of everything. As Alice Roosevelt famously observed, my father wanted to be the corpse at every funeral, the bride at every wedding, and the baby at every christening. <laughs> he believed for himself. <laughs> I did tell you at the beginning that humility was not a significant part of the meeting. <laughs> he believed passionately in the centrality of the executive branch of the United States system of government and that the United States uh, Constitution gave federal government the authority to act vigorously in the interests of the general welfare of the nation. Now, virtually since Theodore Roosevelt, every American president has believed that, but on the whole, before that, he didn't take that view. Throughout his presidency, he favoured tighter regulation of big business, especially railroads, and strong uh, executive action against mon monopolistic uh, trusts. He believed that the United States as a great nation had a mission to extend its superior and peaceful civilization to the rest of the world. Sea power was a vital component of this mission, during both his vice presidency and presidency, he expanded the Navy. In 1901, the US Navy had 11 battleships. By 1913, it had 36, and had become the, the third largest Navy in the world after the British and the Germans. In 1903, he secured the right to construct the Panama Canal by sending US warships to ensure Panama's secession from Colombia. In 1906, he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for his mediation in the Russo-Japanese War. Now, T.R. Weepit, like uh, uh, Grant, was an ardent conservationist. In 1906, he signed an Antiquities Act, allowing presidents to declare as national monuments historic landmarks historic and prehistoric statues, and other objects of historic or scientific interest. Originally intended to protect prehistoric Indian remains, TR interpreted the legislation very broadly to save many sites of outstanding natural beauty, such as the Grand Canyon, and to create millions of acres of new national forests. TR supported William Howard Taft, his Secretary of State, as the Republican candidate for presidency in 1908, and withdrew from politics for two years to go on a world tour. On his return, he tried to re-enter politics, but failing to deprive Taft of the Republican nomination for the presidency in 1912, he stood as a progressive candidate against both Taft and Woodrow Wilson, the Democratic candidate. The central platform of uh, his campaign was the creation of a national government which would exercise broad powers to govern the country in the interests of the people as a whole. 
While campaigning in Milwaukee in October 1912, J.F. shrank a New York bar owner who had been stalking uh, Roosevelt for weeks, shot him in the chest. Roosevelt's life was saved by the presence of his 15-page campaign speech folded over twice <laughs> and his glasses case in his broad breast pocket, which slowed down the bullet. <laughs> I'm sure a lot of you are all pleased that nobody was around giving 50-page campaign speeches these days. <laughs> Although wounded, with blood seeping into his shirt, he delivered his scheduled uh, speech and spoke for 90 minutes before accepting medical attention. <laughs> He told his audience, Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know whether you understand that I've just been shot, but it takes more than that to kill a bull moose. Now, the reference to the bull moose is the fact that um, I think Democrats' symbol is a donkey and the Republicans is an elephant. Well, um, uh, Roosevelt chose a bull moose as a symbol for the Progressive Party, so that's what that's all about. Um, although Roosevelt polled more votes than Taft, by splitting the Republican vote, TR's intervention enabled the election of Woodrow Wilson. Roosevelt regarded the Great War as a titanic struggle between the forces of good, represented by the United Kingdom and France, and evil, represented by Germany. He deplored US neutrality and despised Woodrow Wilson. When uh, the United States finally entered the war, all four of T.R.'s sons served. With the death and action of Quentin, his youngest son, in July 1918, T.R.'s zest for life vanished. His health declined rapidly. He died in sleep on the 5th of January 1919. Thomas Marshall, Wilson's vice president, observed, death had to take Roosevelt sleeping. For if he hadn't been awake, it would have been a fight. <laughs> and the last president that I want to talk to you about today is Harry S. Truman, who is rapidly becoming my favorite US president. Uh, Harry uh, Truman is the 33rd president of the United States, and he was one of the outstanding presidents of the 20th century. His four grandparents were all Americans of several generations standing who had settled in Missouri in the 1840s. His father's side of the family was English. Although often overlooked as a, a, an Ulster Scots president, the Youngs, his mother's family, had their origins in Ulster. The S in Harry S. Truman's name stood for absolutely nothing. And this is often a hallmark of Scotch-Irish heritage. It's something that Scotch-Irish do. Don't ask me why, but they do. The future president spent his earliest years on a succession of farms until the family moved to independent Missouri. Graduating from high school in 1901, he worked as a clerk in a Kansas uh, City bank until 1906, when he became a farmer on land owned by his young grandmother. Truman had all of his aspirations to becoming an army officer and had served in the new uh, formed uh, National Guard, which is sort of the equivalent of the Territorial Army. His grandmother took exception to the blue uniform. When he appeared in it, she told him it was the first time a blue, i.e. a Union uniform, had been seen in her house since 1863, and that he was not to bring it back there again. <laughs> it was in the First World War that Truman exhibited leadership qualities. In July 1918, a fresh artillery captain, he was given command of the D battery of the 2nd Battalion of the 129th Field Artillery. The 34-year-old Truman was a straight-laced Freemason who loved history books and wore Irish glasses. So, um, you know, having bad eyesight is not an, an obstacle to being an um, American president. By the way of contrast, D battery, known as the Dizzy D, was a notoriously obstreperous um, unit, proving too much for several of Truman's predecessors. 
It was full of wild young Irish Catholics from Kansas City, whose mode of behaviour and outlook on the world were radically different from those of Truman. At his first parade, one of the men remembered a stirring among his fellows. Although they were standing at tension, you could feel the Irish blood boiling, as much as to say, why, if this guy thinks he's going to take us over, he's mistaken. Confronted by 200 hostile, pairs of hostile eyes, Truman admitted, I could see my hide on the fence. Never on the front or anywhere else have I ever felt so nervous. Unable to say very much, he eventually told the men they were dismissed. They let out a Bronx cheer, an enormous raspberry of derision, and staged a brawl in the evening. Next morning, Truman was the list of all the NCOs he had busted to the ranks for being responsible for instigating the brawl. He told the rest, I didn't come over here to get along with you. You've got to get along with me. And if there are any of you who can't, speak up right now and I'll bust you right back now. However, he ended with a promise. You soldier for me, and I soldier for you. He was as good as his word, becoming an extremely efficient and respected officer. He whipped the Dizzy D into a ship as a superb combat unit. The Dizzy D took part in the huge American Muse Argonne offensive in the Argonne Forest at the end of September 1918. During this offensive, the Americans fired off a greater weight of ammunition than the Union side had done in the entire American Civil War. After a week of fighting, the exhausted artillerymen were pulled back for rest. Truman had lost 20 pounds in weight, but they returned uh, to the front for the end of the war. Truman recalled the armistice, but firing ceased all along the line. It was so quiet, it made me feel as if I'd been suddenly deprived of my ability to hear. The men of the guns, the captain, the lieutenants, the sergeants and the corporals looked at each other for some time, and then a cheer arose all along the line. Truman returned home in 1919. He operated a haberdashery in Kansas City until it failed in 1922. In 1922, he became a judge for the Eastern District of Jackson County, in Missouri. In 1926, he became the presiding judge, a position he retained until he was elected as a Democrat to the U.S. Senate in 1934. In the Senate, he made a reputation for himself as a workhorse rather than a show horse. Greatly admired by his fellow senators, he became Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Reluctant running mate in the presidential election of 1944. He was only vice president for uh, 11 weeks and five days before becoming president on FDR's death on the 12th of April 1945. During his presidency, Truman took a number of historically important decisions which went far to shape the second half of the 20th century. He decided to drop the first atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki to bring the Second World War to an end. Truman had a much more realistic appraisal of Stalin and the Soviet Union than uh, FDR had. He viewed FDR sort of regarded the British with greater suspicion than the Russians, but Truman didn't. In a speech to Congress in March 1947, Truman identified the Soviet Union as America's greatest foe, declaring that the world had to decide between two ways of life, freedom or totalitarianism. Truman was responsible for the Truman Doctrine, the Marshall Plan, the Berlin Airlift, the formation of NATO, and the intervention in Korea to prevent North Korea's bid to take over South Korea. Although a Democrat, Truman's presidency is highly rated by Democrats and Republicans alike. Roy Jenkins, in his study of Truman, offers a fascinating comparison between the 32nd and the 33rd presidents. And he concludes, 
Truman was in some ways superior to Roosevelt. He did not have his style, his resonance, his confidence, his occasional sweep of imagination, or his tolerance and understanding of diverse human nature. But he was less vain, less devious, and better to work for. And he goes on. He was more decisive, and quite apart from Roosevelt's physical disability, he had more sustained energy than the wartime Roosevelt. He was mostly better briefed, and not only in an immediate and superficial sense, he was at least as well read in history and biography as Roosevelt. Now, as I told you earlier, uh, the Americans have this obsession with rank ordering uh, American presidents. Roosevelt is currently shooting up the league table uh, at the press of the Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much.